The Future, this is a superb long read essay in The New Yorker by Evan Osnos, The Future of America's Contest with China. Washington is an intensifying standoff with Beijing. Which one will fundamentally shape the 21st century, he asks. It's a long read, well worth reading in full. He's describing those celebrations, China at 70, on the balcony to Z's right was the Politburo's reigning propagandist, Wang Huning, a former professor who once traveled the United States and honed a prickly theory about dealing with its people. The Americans pay attention to strength, he wrote after attending a football game at the Naval Academy. Football has some strategy, but it's not elegant. Mainly, it relies on strength. Z, uh, no force can shake the status of our great motherland. No force can stop the advance of the Chinese people and the Chinese nation. The most anticipated moment of the day was the debut of a state-of-the-art missile called the Dongfeng-41, which can travel at 25 times the speed of sound toward targets more than 9,000 miles away. You overestimated your abilities to transform the world, he said. You can't simply write the screenplay for the future. China, India, the rest of the world, everyone will have a hand in the script. They thought China was going to throw up the white flag, Hugh said, but China kept up the fight. It appears that the ability to inflict pain on China is not what you thought it would be. For years, the two were kicking each other under the table, Min Xin Pei, a government professor at Claremont McKenna College said, now all the kicking is out in the open. They also likened China to such sworn enemies of America as Iran and the Soviet Union and argue that only hardline pressure can crush its expansion. Discussing a book at the National Press Club, Gingrich told his audience, if you don't want your grandchildren speaking Chinese and obeying Beijing, then this is a topic we better have a national dialogue about. He called China the greatest threat to us since the British Empire in the 1770s, much greater than Nazi Germany or the Soviet Union. As I walked, I took to counting surveillance cameras. There are now an estimated 800,000 in the capital, nearly triple the number in place a decade ago. In Hong Kong, protesters have attacked the cameras as symbols of Beijing's control. Every capital city prizes security, but in Xi's Beijing, it has been elevated to a state religion. Chinese leaders, for all their projections of confidence, see peril everywhere. A precarious economy, an aging population, an Arab Spring-style revolt in Hong Kong, an ethnic insurgency. In 2018, China surpassed the Soviet Union as history's longest surviving communist state, a distinction that fuels both pride and paranoia. Chinese leaders have been alarmed by American support of popular uprisings, first the color revolutions in the former Soviet bloc, and then the Arab Spring, and they resent America's efforts to deepen its influence in China, in Asia. In a speech in 2013, he asked, why did the Soviet Communist Party collapse? His answer, their ideals and convictions wavered. In Beijing, an ideological revival is in flamboyant effect since June. The party has been waging an old-fashioned dogmatic crusade 
known as Correct the Wind campaign. In a modern twist, 90 million party members have been given an app loaded with Z speeches, quizzes about his life story and videos on history. The app keeps track of what they finish. Xi Jinping thinks the whole place slacked off ideologically, Jeremy Barmey, an independent historian, said. Instead of city walls, the party relies on digital defences. Day by day, censors purify the internet of subversive ideas and facial recognition technologies track people's comings and goings. We will have a two-centred world, he said cheerfully, like two yolks in one egg. A duopolistic world, like Boeing and Airbus, two companies in a zero-sum competition. Violence will become a common phenomenon, he said, like the Palestinian kids firing on Israeli police, but not as grave. That's a comment about Hong Kong. The party believes that if you take one step backward, everything will unravel, Barme said. The struggle, not the resolution of it, is the way of maintaining unity and primacy. In early 2009, Coke was negotiating a $2.4 billion deal to buy China Huan Juice Group, the largest ever foreign takeover of a Chinese company. But on March 15, the FBI alerted Coke executives that hackers had broken into their system and were rummaging through emails about the negotiation, recording keystrokes and controlling their computers remotely. Three days later, the talks were dead. Security firms eventually traced the breach to hackers who worked from a 12-story building on the outskirts of Shanghai, Unit 61398, the People's Liberation Army. For as long as American intelligence community has been online, it has been hacking foreign governments. China did that too, but its hackers also plundered foreign businesses. The US has asked 61 countries to ban Huawei equipment, but only three, Australia, New Zealand and Japan, have agreed. Senator Mark Warner, top Democrat on the Intelligence Committee, supports efforts to stop China's theft of trade secrets, but he calls Trump's broader strategy erratic and incoherent. As a share of the economy, America's federal investment in research and development has fallen to its lowest point since 1955. Since 2017, China has erected an unprecedented digital and physical enclosure around Muslims in its Xinjiang region. It is estimated that more than a million people have been interned in facilities known officially as vocational training centers. Millions more are tracked every day by facial recognition cameras, fingerprints, cell phone patterns and biometric data collected through a program of mandatory exams known as Physicals for All. When Trump first imagined uncoupling or decoupling as it became known, the term evoked a divorce, but a complete decoupling is implausible. Total revenue of U.S. companies and affiliates in China in 2017 for one year is $544 billion, Krober told me. What's the chance these numbers can go down 80 or 90 percent? Almost no chance. We can remove a few of those tangles, but the cost to the U.S. economy of removing them all would be unacceptably high. Amid the trade war, Starbucks announced plans to open 3,000 new Chinese stores by 2023, an average of one every 15 hours. Tesla opened a plant in Shanghai that will build 150,000 cars a year. Trump's advisers also fundamentally miscalculated the effect of their actions. In July 2016, Navarro predicted that the mere threat of tariffs would force China to capitulate. The purpose is not to impose tariffs, he said. The purpose is to use the threat of tariffs 
as a way of getting the attention of any trading partners that cheat and basically encouraging them to play by the rules, knowing that Trump, if they don't, damn well will follow through on that promise. A tariff program, he said, is kind of like the military. If it's strong enough, then nobody messes with you. With the presidential election a year away, Trump's trade wars becoming a political liability, the Chinese side was in no rush to resolve it. In September, an American billionaire investor told me he had advised the president to show progress if he wanted a strong economy on election day. You have to have a deal done by the end of the year, the investor said. If you get a deal in March or April, by then the economy is already gone. Chinese analysts have described their side's approach as da, 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 tan, tan, fight, fight, talk, talk, a pointed expression that Mao used in the 1940s to describe his strategy when Americans pressured him to stop fighting the rival nationalist army. Mark Fisher, a lanky American running the NBA's operation in China, told me the sky's the limit for basketball here. Nearly 15 years later, much of that prediction is true. China is the NBA's most lucrative domain outside the US. By October, Daryl Morley, the general manager of the Houston Rockets, posted a slogan to his personal Twitter feed, Fight for Freedom, Stand with Hong Kong. He later deleted the tweet. Chinese commentators flooded Mori's Twitter account with angry notes, including NMSL, Chinese slang for your mother is dead. Rather than coming to Mori's defense, the NBA issued an obsequious statement in Chinese. We're extremely disappointed in the inappropriate remarks made by the Houston Rockets <coughs> general manager, Daryl Morley. NBA kerfuffle exposed a larger phenomenon. China's market had become so crucial to American institutions that they were blandly accepting demands for censorship and submission. China is not exporting a state ideology in the manner of the Soviet Union, but it wants to make the world more amenable to its ideology. So it has demanded extraterritorial censorship, compelling outsiders to accept limits on free speech beyond its borders. For years, Hollywood studios have agreed to cut material from their films to get into China. The question becomes, what's the result of all this? The result is that there are a million or more Muslims in re-education camps in China, and you really don't hear much about it. Accepting censorship for profit rests on the tempting logic that Chinese buyers with a bowdlerized portrait of the world is better than not reaching them at all. Um, in fact, censored imports have helped uh, acclimatize Chinese citizens to a parallel reality in which Freddie Mercury was not gay and which nobody in the NBA cares about Hong Kong. Google developed a prototype of a censored search engine called Dragonfly, which would have blocked thousands of words and phrases including human rights and student process, uh, protest. The CEO Sundar Pichai said in 2018, I think it's important for us, given how important the market is and how many users there are. After protests by employees, Google announced that it had halted work on the project. The Soviets were going after the hearts and minds of the local populations. Guajardo said the Chinese couldn't care less. Trump offers an impressionistic version of these facts. Discussing China over dinner with CEOs, he reportedly said that almost every student that comes over to this country is a spy. Um, then he's interviewing various Chinese students. One says he feels his countrymen are too quick to dismiss what he loves about life outside. They've lost their basic ability to think independently, I think. Closest China and the U.S. have come to an actual fight in recent decades was in 1996 in a squabble over the island of Taiwan, the landmine at the center of the relationship. Taiwan has resisted communist control since 1949, and America has pledged to defend it from attacks. In March 1996, Beijing, fearing that Taiwan was moving toward independence, fired ballistic missiles into the waters off the coast. 
U.S. still spends more than twice as much on defense each year, but if a similar crisis emerged today, China would not need to back down. In war games commissioned by the Pentagon, China routinely wins battles with America over Taiwan. People's Daily declared whichever country becomes America's most important competitor, America will try to contain it. Beijing coveted control of the South China Sea for natural resources and strategic terrain. In 2012, it seized a reef near the Philippines called Scarborough Shoal, China's boldest use of force in the area. The administration considered it a minor diplomatic dispute and did not want to risk violence in order to push China back. No drama Obama didn't want any messiness, a former US official said. Today the Chinese say, we can't believe you didn't react. In 2014, China started building artificial islands atop seven reefs in the South China Sea. Obama pressured Xi to stop and in the Rose Garden, Xi said that China had no intention to militarize the islands, but the military construction never ceased. China calls the islands necessary defense facilities. If you talk to folks in the Pentagon, they say they're no longer debating whether or not China is an enemy. They're planning for war. Most dangerous frontier between Chinese and American power today is the contested terrain of the Western Pacific, Taiwan, the South China Sea, and a series of shoals and islands that are unfamiliar to the American public. If we think we can maintain the same dominance we have had since 1945, well, that train has left the station. We're not doing that. Instead, what we're doing are things that masquerade as a strategy, but in fact amount to just kicking them in the balls. Each side has embraced a form of fight, fight, talk, talk. A peace that is no peace, as Orwell said. Kissinger, we're dealing with a bipolar world, now we're dealing with a multipolar world. The components of an international system are so much more varied and the lineups are much more difficult to control. The ascendant view in Washington holds that the competition is us or them. The reality of this century will be us and them. It is naive to imagine wrestling China back to the past. The project now is to contest its moral vision of the future. I wrote about China several times. Uh, 7th of October last year, China's turning 70. Uh, they've stood up. I said Xi's model is one of technocratic authoritarianism. And I was speaking about a recent book that, oh, that was on his bookshelf, The Master Algorithm by Pedro Domingos, and saying he's building an algorithmic society. It's taken the propagation of ideology and the cult of personality to extremes not seen since the days of Chairman Mao. I also said the world in the 21st century exhibits viral, wildfire, and exponential characteristics and feedback loops which only become obvious in hindsight. And I was venturing that his high water mark was actually behind him. 26th of August last year, China strikes back at Trump. I was talking about Trump is beholden to the stock market and China has the ability to dump on that. 27th of May, talking about how the China-US war was turning ballistic um, and, and, and Frederick Wu, I was quoting him, who says we've been given a list of surrender demands for China to acquiesce to. If there is a decoupling between the two economies, so be it. The Chinese people can endure more pain than the spoiled and hubristic American. 10th of December 2018, I was writing about the truce dinner, which was followed by the arrest of the Huawei executive in Canada. March 2018, about how China has unveiled a digital panopticon in Xinjiang. Dissent is measured and snuffed out very quickly. The video surveillance face, license plate recognition, mobile device locations, um, and uh, speaking about that in depth. At 21st of October last year, I was saying, if we're, unless we're going to Xinjiang the whole world, the current modus operandi is running on empty. Um, Chinese dream, I said, has become a nightmare at the boundaries of the Han Empire. 
9th of July 2018, tariff wars, who blinks first? And I was using the example of James Dean, the Chicky Run, um, and the two heading towards the cliff, and whoever jumps out last being the winner. 23rd of December last year, I said the crossfire of a trade war, which is now ebbing for a few months, well, because Trump has an election to win and Z has an economy to rescue. 15th of October 2018, I was saying war is coming. 